Whoa, so another beautiful, cool, foggy morning here in Maine. And Jim's back out here cutting some grass and we're gonna do a little more feature work out here. And I think this is awesome. Um, I love this grass-fed vegetable model. And you know, so many people pay to go to CrossFit or go to the gym in the morning. So many people buy implements like fertilizers and pesticides and other stuff for their garden where Jim is getting a workout his main source of nutrition for the garden is coming from this field and he's literally stacking functions here. Um, you know, using no pest control, very minimal water, and literally this grass is his main source of nutrition. He's also noticed some new things this year that he's been sharing with us I think is really exciting. So let's see what's going on. I see him over there sharpening. Oh, you getting your morning workout over here? Yeah, got to have a little more grass. Um, the garden's getting hungry. Almost, It's almost all gone from that second mulching. So if this doesn't work out as hay for the animals, it's going to work out as uh, food for the micro herd, which is amazingly hungry. So, you know, you're asking about details of why I do this, and I kind of forget, you know, what's going on in my, you know, system that I developed over the years. You just get used to what it does but i remembered back you know maybe 10 years ago at common ground there was a guy i was speaking there talking about the grass fed vegetables for one of the first times and a guy was in front of me i was waiting to use the venue and listen to him he's a very well-known author gardener um and he gave you know an hour-long presentation on you know how he controls weeds what kind of irrigation he uses what kind of fertility schedule and composting system he uses and as I was listening to him, I was going, wow, what I'm doing, I don't have to do any of that. So that makes me think how much upfront time I'm spending here, but what it's eliminating. You know, right now, if you go to most farms, the weeds are out of control, especially with a rainy year like this. I remember tide mill, you could barely find the veggies. I mean, they still got crop. So you'll see here, you know, when we go back to our garden, there's not a weed, you know? And, you know, I haven't added any fertilizer. We've had a wet year, so it has, irrigation hasn't been a problem. Um, so I really think this is a unique thing. I mean, it doesn't solve all the problems, but it's definitely worth experimenting about. And then I was also thinking about the intangible. You know, people can't, you, you can't consider some of this stuff, but, um, you know, I've been kind of innovative with some of the stuff I do, and it's pretty much directly um, informed by this time in the field. You wouldn't believe how many of the ideas I've had during these two and three hours when I'm out here. You know, the grass-fed greenhouse, that's where that came from. You know, and that is priceless. You can't buy that. I mean, you might get crazy ideas off the internet while you're surfing, but to be on the land that you're going to be working, listening to what it's telling you, you're going to get things that nobody else can get. You won't get it off the internet because it's personal. This land is specific to its region, and I'm an you know, a, a inhabitant here. And if I want to open my mind and listen, which this does allow me to do, it's kind of a zen kind of thing. I mean, you can see I really don't have to have much effort. I don't even have to think because I can still talk to you and keep mowing. So how cool would it be if there was 10 of you out here and we heard this noise all the way across the field, huh? Yeah, and the peening. Well, you could also hear the tink, 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 tink. You know, and I'm working on that. I think eventually that will come to pass if I live long enough. Um, you know, there's more and more people moving to the neighborhood that are interested, and there are small landowners, you know. Yeah, I think it's possible that this could be, you know, like a, a road where there's a lot of innovation going on. Um, you know, a lot of neighbors are doing innovative things, trying to figure things out, and a lot of neighbors are going back to what worked here, you know, a century ago. Animals on this land kept it rich. This area was known for some of the most fertile hay fields that are around the area. Right now, because of lack of, you know, habitation with people um, and lack of 
value, placing value on, you know, food and land care, it has gone back to work, which isn't bad, um, you know, because that's habitat for other things, but the human population, unless it's going to rely on this crazy long supply chain, needs to figure out a way to, you know, subsist within an ecosystem, you know, as a, um, you know, keystone species. You know, I, you know, a lot of the environmentalists kind of take for granted somehow that we don't belong here. And, you know, I don't believe that. You know, we're here as a species and we can be a beneficial species. As a keystone species, we often, um, you know, make changes in habitat with disturbances. But all keystone species do that. I always think about Brock Doman when he talks about beavers. You know, that they're so integral to land preservation. And when they got trapped out, it really messed things up. But, you know, they make big changes in a landscape. You know, that little meadow mouse that gets flooded out, he's going to drown or die. But the habitat increasing with the trout and the beaver pond and all the regeneration of the you know, sediments following into that, you know, and he's trimming the edges. It's, it's a really cool thing. And I think we can find our niche like that, especially if we let go of the reliance on machines. Because I always say, if a beaver had a backhoe, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> I like it. This is Thoughts from the Scythe with Jim. I wonder what else I was thinking about. Oh, probably lunch. Nah, second breakfast we call it here. Second breakfast, huh? Yeah, I always have a six o'clock breakfast, oatmeal and coffee, and then some more protein back at the home. Tell us what you had last night. Do you have some of that uh, harvest? Oh yeah, we had, we still got some of Bessie, our milk cow, in the freezer as burgers. So we had that and chanterelles with blueberries for dessert. So pretty much everything was local last night. Yep. Nice. Yeah, we ain't making our own ketchup yet, so that wasn't local, but... That's coming. Our neighbor makes it, so we should have had You got enough tomatoes, you're close. But yeah, we will have enough tomatoes. We'll have enough tomatoes. More, some more thoughts from the garden with Jim this morning. I can tell you as I'm walking through this field, I've almost fallen a couple times and broken an ankle just from the way they used to cut this field with the tractor, the deep ruts that are in here. I can see what Jim's saying now with the crazy rains we're having. I mean, yeah, sure, you could come across this with the tractor compaction. You're going to destroy the land. So, you know, just another reason to kind of look at what Jim's doing. It makes sense. So if you guys enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button. If you want to see more of Jim, more of the cool stuff we're doing, Jim, when he gets down to Florida, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Tap that bell to stay notified. Most importantly, get out there and cut grass, pound grass, pound dirt.